Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Myung Jin and San. I want to talk a little bit about some meditation instructions from where they came and how they're taught now and how it was taught to me. This is one of those situations where um, we're given teachings, we're given instructions, we'll call them instructions, that's more accurate. And we never really quite know what the source is. Okay, uh, I started sitting with a, uh, a group, um, Soto group, affiliated with San Francisco Zen Center. And Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, of course, was prominent amongst the uh, references that people had. And, you know, of course, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind is, uh, should be, if it isn't, on the menu for all uh, Western Zen practitioners because it does really give a, uh, a good um, start of how to maintain your, your mind. Um, but it was like, okay, you got your posture, you got your breathing, you breathe from the, from the diaphragm or the uh, chi, or fu, uh, or hara, whatever it might be, that's spot two inches below your navel, depending on how tall you are, I suppose. And, um, you know, darkened room, uh, you know, in, in their case, it was, you know, sitting facing a wall, and, um, and that was basically it. And, and you know, you would see that right out of uh, Zen Mind Beginner's Mind. And I don't know how many of us ever gave any thought as to whence it came. I kind of always assumed that Suzuki Roshi didn't just invent it. But I really didn't know where it came from. You know, historically, uh, that group tended to skip from Suzuki Roshi directly to Dogen, and then a whole large gap on either side of Dogen. So all these instructions have been around for a while, but as to who actually came up with the original idea, uh, it never really came up. And honestly, it's not all that important, but it is sort of interesting. As it turns out, uh, there's a, a book called The Spirit of Zen, and it's a recent, like 2018 copyright and uh, it has a lot to do with the manuscripts that were unearthed from the Dunhuang uh, caves, where these scrolls had been sealed for a thousand plus years. And that's where a lot of the uh, initial Zen teachings came from. Now, let me give a disclaimer here. We have a lot of Zen teachers who are supposed to be in certain lineages and it's supposed to be unbroken. And some teachers are, some teachings are attributed to them. And uh, this may or may not all be apocryphal and it doesn't matter. We could have a, a Dharma teaching from Bodhidharma, 
Or we could have the same Dharma teaching from Bobby Dharma. We could read the Vimala Kirti Sutra, or we could get the Dharma from Vin Lamakirti, the haulage business owner. And if it's the Dharma, it's the Dharma, and it doesn't matter whose mouth or whose pen it came from. If it's a Dharma teaching, it's a Dharma teaching. So what I'm doing now is I'm going with whatever teaching has been attributed to whomever is how it's going to be for me. Because I have no reason to doubt it, nor do I have any reason to believe it wholeheartedly, 100%. But, like I said, I have no reason to doubt it either. And it's unimportant. So... One Mind Zen Collective is in uh, what we call the East Mountain Sanghas. And it's a loose confeder confederation of a couple of different Zen groups with no hierarchy whatsoever other than we share some common teachings with each other our practices, ceremonies, and so forth may be identical. They may not be. Doesn't matter. And one of the reasons that we went with East Mountain, aside from the fact that it has to do with uh, our teacher's uh, name, uh, translated, of course, um, it also seemed like one of those teachings that fell into the gap. A set of teachers, not teachings per se. So it was really interesting. Everybody knows Bodhidharma. Most people have probably heard of Huika. Bodhidharma had some teachings attributed to him. What most people might know about Huika is that he chopped off an arm to prove his sincerity that he wanted to be Bodhidharma's student. We know of Sengsan, the third patriarch, mostly through the Jinjin Ming which is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the uh, ultimate collections of uh, teachings in a single uh, document. And then there's Dao Jin, who's the fourth patriarch and a student of Seng San's, and you never really hear anything about him. And then there's Hongren, which he was Huinang's teacher. And other than, you know, a few little anecdotes that we get from the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch, we don't really know that much about Hongren either. And then there's Huinang, and we know plenty about him from the Platform Sutra uh, and I guess Shen Wei's uh, proselytizing. But Dao Jin, the fourth patriarch, as it turns out in these uh, scrolls from the Dunhuang cave, has a boatload of teachings. And apparently, he was the first Zen teacher who left clear and specific instructions on how to practice sitting meditation. Which is nice considering that sitting meditation is sort of the job description of Zen practitioners, among other things, but that's certainly, if you ain't doing that, you probably ain't practicing Zen. And there were a few different levels of um, practice. Uh, 
uh, methods attributed to him. Uh, this apparently was the first instance that sitting in a quiet, darkened room, um, sit unmoving, let go of the multitude of confused thoughts, uh, not grasping at appearances, uh, focusing your mind on a single point. And where it gets interesting here is because he says that for the novice, the noob, that that single point to be focused on is a single Buddha. He didn't say focus on the Buddha. He said focus on a Buddha. When you're new, I would imagine that could be confusing because you wouldn't really know when you're new that there are a multitude of Buddhas. But uh, if you were around in the year 800 and probably in a monastery, you're probably exposed to that more so than most of us would be. But he says to focus your mind on a single Buddha and recite his name. Then with an upright posture, facing toward the place where the Buddha resides, Say, stay constantly mindful of this single Buddha. In this state of mind, you will be able to see every Buddha of the past and future clearly manifest. I read that last bit there. So darkened room, upright posture, focusing your mind, on a single Buddha. That's where it gets interesting. And I say it's interesting because at some point early in my practice, somebody suggested that I do that. Not necessarily, you know, chant his name per se, but somebody said at some point or another, think of the Buddha which, okay, I was new, I wasn't going to quibble with it. And as it stands now, lo, these many years later, quite often when I'm sitting, I may still chant Namu Amita Bull. I take refuge in a Amita Buddha. It's got six syllables and I pace it on inhales and exhales, one syllable per inhale, one syllable per outhale. And it's fine. When I was originally taught, uh, it was uh, count the breaths. Okay, count one, inhale, two, exhale, so on and so forth get up to 10, and then start over again. And the idea was that you would be mindful of when you hit 15, not be judgmental about it, and just start over at that point, which is also a valuable teaching. Mindfulness of the Buddha, visualizing and reciting his name, leads to a state of non-dual awareness. So even from the get-go, from the standpoint of the novice, this concentration on the Buddha, being mindful of the Buddha, even visualizing the Buddha and reciting his name, chanting his name, is going to lead to a state of non-dual 
awareness. And I think the key word in there may be awareness. The second method for uh, meditation that Dao Jin had is simply becoming aware of and reading into the mind's nature. Basically paying attention to your thoughts, not getting attached to them, not necessarily putting value judgments on them, but if you were thinking of the Buddha, then your mind's nature will be much closer to your true nature. Let's put it that way. When you're doing this, you're moving towards your true nature, toward realizing your true nature. Third practice in Dao Jin's teachings is uh, analyzing physical forms, uh, particularly your own body, with a mind to establishing that uh, the body, all physical phenomena, and so on, are all uh, empty, devoid of any individual lasting permanent self to them. From my end of things, I was told that, you know, you should pay attention to your posture, right? Pay attention to your mudra. You know, fingers or thumbs just barely touching close enough so that a, a slice of paper could pass through them. Does paper come in slices? Probably a sheet of paper. For me, I've always been inclined towards uh, noticing breathing, not necessarily the breath so much. Uh, I remember once, like it was a, a fairly intense, intensive uh, sitting that was going on, and I remarked to somebody that uh, my heart was beating really strongly. Not like, you know, a panic or a manic -y sort of thing. It was just like really pronounced lub dub going on. And, uh, you know, I asked, does anybody else experience that? And then they all kind of looked at me like, well, they didn't, if they did, they didn't want to admit to it. They were focusing on the breath. So focusing on a single point, calming the mind, becoming at ease, realizing the emptiness of all physical phenomena, you've got Samatha and Vipassana meditation right there, right? Physical awareness, the Vipassana, calming the mind, focusing, generating a sense of equanimity is all Samatha. When you are at the beginning of sitting meditation practice, stay in a quiet place, closely observe your own body and mind. 
and Dao Jin says, the above are the skillful means for novices. I would like to think that we're not so full of ourselves to consider ourselves beyond being novices. The Wisdom Sutra, taught by Manjushri, says, uh, Manjushri asked the Buddha, of, O you whom the world honors, what is the single practice concentration? The Buddha replied, the nature of reality exists in equality. Being connected to the nature of reality is called the single practice concentration. So if you enter into the single practice concentration, then you will know for certain that all Buddhas, as numerous as numerous as the grains of sand in the Ganges, are no different from the nature of reality itself. This very body and mind are always the site of awakening in every step you take. Whatever you do, wherever you go, it is all awakening. We're mindful of the Buddha. Being mindful of the Buddha helps to eliminate the mentality of the three poisons, greed, hatred, and delusion. It eliminates the mentality of grasping. It eliminates the tendency we have to be judgmental, as Seng San might refer to it, having preferences, or in other translations, picking and choosing. When you're mindful of the Buddha continuously through every state of mind, it will simply become clear and calm, and mindfulness will no longer be based on perceptual objects. What does mindfulness without an object mean? Mindfulness of the Buddha is the same state of mind as that which we call mindfulness without an object. There is no separate Buddha distinct from the mind, nor a separate mind distinct from the Buddha. So mindfulness of the Buddha is the same as mindfulness of the mind. Seeking the Buddha is the same as seeking the mind. When our single point of meditation is the Buddha and the Dharma, the Buddha and his teachings. There are going to be unavoidable benefits. And I'm not one to say that sitting in meditation is like a guarantee for anything. We sit with no gaining notion is, I believe, one of Dogen's statements. But even if we sit without any expectations, odds are pretty good that if we are mindfulness of the Buddha, at some point or another, we're also going to be mindful of the mind. And at that point, we see our true nature, and then we can help all sentient beings.